Like any actor, Kong needed a stage on which to perform. For him, it was a series of plywood tabletops. There would be a lot of holes drilled into the surface of the tabletop because with an animated puppet, you need a way of locking him to the, to the floor that he's walking on. Yes, yeah, so we're just drilling out uh, tie-down holes where Kong's going to walk. So this will be his path. You have to do tie-downs, is what they called, where the, the feet are attached firmly because as you shift the puppet, you're putting a lot of weight and muscles behind shifting the stiff, jointed puppet, and you need his feet to be locked to the table. But in the fight with the T-Rex, you have the Tyrannosaurus jumping, and then you have the uh, scene where Kong flips him. And in those kind of things, they had to work out a way to support the weight of the models um, and move them one frame at a time. And if you watch it frame by frame, you can actually see some of the rods that they use to keep them from falling over during the shot. In most instances, the animation tabletop would be partially dressed with a miniature environment such as Kong's carefully crafted jungle foliage. The jungles in Kong are the coolest jungles I've ever seen in a movie. They were going for a Gustave Doré style, where the foreground images are very, very dark, and the background are light, haliated, kind of glowing backgrounds, and cathedral-like jungles, you know? I mean, it was that look, which is, is very storybook. They used a very particular technique to build all the foliage and trees and rock faces, and we wanted to capture that exact aesthetic again. The rocks and land formations were built out of plaster. Then the trees were wooden dowels that were covered with clay, and then tissue paper that was shellacked. And the foliage was a combination of real plants that were put in place. And some of the things like palm fronds and ferns were cut out of very, very thin copper. This is just a test for PJ to look at um, of the different types of leaves. This one is brass up here, and it's we're worried it might be a little too flimsy. And uh, this is alley, and it's a lot more poseable, yet it's not going to fly around on the tree because everything needs to be so locked down while they're animating. They had to carefully attach all the little leaves and all the little vines and all the little mosses. Everything you see, they had to build or paint or create, you know, to detail. O'Brien also made extensive use of matte paintings, flat art that creates the illusion of depth without the expense of building three-dimensional sets. Matte paintings done on glass provide foreground elements. What you'd often have in your typical King Kong setup is you might have one or two sheets of glass in front of the camera that would have extra pieces of jungle painted on. For example, the vines or the sides of trees or overhanging jungle growth and the camera actually shoots through that painting onto your set to create the feeling of a deep, dense jungle that just kept going back and back and back into infinity. Now, in many cases, he didn't use a glass painting. He used an actually, actual built foreground. But it's kind of inconvenient, particularly for lighting, if you have all the layers actually physically built because they have thickness. So if you build, let's say, just the one or two physical elements, the layers in front of that are just paintings on glass, that means that you can get light in between them, makes it much easier to light. The matte paintings in King Kong were crafted by a team of skilled artists that included Byron Crabb, Henri Hillink, and a man who would continue to work alongside O'Brien for the next 20 years. Mario Laranaga was a very good artist in the art department there at RKO. When O'Brien uh, started to work on creation, and he sort of discovered his talents and moved him onto his crew. That painting is pretty rare now, other than doing something as a special project. About 10, 15 years ago, it became digital. So it's a lost art. It's so physical, it's so inefficient comparatively. I really wanted to get back on my computer after I did this, to tell you the truth. So it's a much more efficient, easier way to, to get good results and make quick changes. What they did on Kong that we discovered by studying photographs is they not only did glass paintings, but then sometimes they would dress on top of the glass. At the bottom, you'd put a few little shrubs or a little bit of jungle foliage and so on and so forth. So now you had a three-dimensional element that you can light. And so we could uh, dapple the light, and we could change it very quickly because you're dealing with something three-dimensional and with real light. For some reason, this piece is scaled so beautifully. Look at that. I don't know what it is. Is it somebody stepped on it? Maybe that's the answer, but you know, look at how fine it is. It really looks good in there. 
Somehow that glass painting technique makes that film look so unique. And then at the very background, they'd often have a matte painting that was a complete painted canvas that would be the very deep background. We had our map painter, Michael Pangrazio, actually um, do a traditional map painting. It was very important to have a good plan, so I would do a sketch and uh, photograph it and project it. Norman Rockwell used the same technique to kind of trace it out and get the composition and then be able to then turn on the, the uh, overhead lights and then start to paint on it. But the painting is very crude, you know. If you look at the painting, it doesn't look that great by itself, but when you see it on film, it works, and that's a matte painter's trick, too. Good matte painting uh, is very impressionistic and very loose. The various paintings and tabletop miniatures come together on stage to form the three-dimensional environment in which Kong lives. The typical Kong jungle setup would be a piece of glass in the foreground with an edge of jungle painted around it, then a tabletop with some miniature trees and foliage, and then maybe in a, some more miniature jungle that finally resolves into a painted cyclorama in the background. So these tabletop setups could be, you know, anywhere from six to eight or 12 foot deep. And the way you make one of these shots work is you actually just look right through the lens and you see, oh, how's this working? Where do we need a tree? And if you need a tree, you just hang it in. Composing the shot was really interesting because if you weren't looking through the camera lens, you know, you had this big matte painting and this glass thing and these tables, it didn't seem to make a lot of sense. But once you look through that lens, it's a perfectly composed shot. It's not a real jungle. It's a jungle of the imagination. It's a very, uh, it's, it's a magical place, really. The, the, these jungles just seemed ready to erupt with prehistoric life, which then Willis O'Brien and his team made happen. <laughs> But bringing Kong to life and making his miniature jungle convincing was only the beginning of what O'Brien hoped to accomplish.